Hello, and welcome to the third in our series of webinars for the Tech Safe Schools program. I'm Doug Wood, the Associate Director of Grassroots Environmental Education, the nonprofit organization that developed the Tech Safe Schools program. Grassroots is a science-based environmental health organization, and much of our work focuses on the unique vulnerability of children. Today, we're gonna to be talking about methods you can use to reduce wireless radiation in classrooms. We're so happy to have as our speaker today, Mr. Mitch Marchand. Mitch is an advanced electromagnetic radiation instructor with the Building Biology Institute and the owner and principal EMF consultant at EMF Aware in Canada. Mitch spent the early part of his career in industrial and electrical engineering for power plants and the oil and gas industry before transitioning to EMF consulting in 2011. For the past 10 years, Mitch has been helping people and organizations across the country deal with excess amounts of wireless radiation and how they can mitigate those exposures. We're really delighted to have him with us today. Ladies and gentlemen, Mr. Mitch Marchand. Welcome everyone to the third webinar of the Tech Safe Schools uh, initiative. This presentation is how to reduce wireless radiation in schools. Um, and we're really excited to dive into how do we actually reduce these exposures. Today, we're mostly be focusing on the how. Uh, if you're interested on the why, you can go see the previous two webinars. Uh, one is the illegal imperative for schools regarding wireless radiation. And webinar two is the science behind uh, the Tech Safe Schools project. So that's the why, and this presentation is all about the how. How do we actually reduce these exposures in the schools? So the goal of the uh, Tech Safe Schools is a completely safe environment for every child. This absolutely does not mean we want a technology-free school, um, but what we do want is as low as reasonably achievable. So there are gonna be things that are gonna be within your control as a school, and there's things that are gonna be outside your control as a school. And um, basically what the focus of this presentation is just the things inside the school. And when we move and remove the wireless technology and go more towards a hardwired technology, um, we're going to get as low as, as we can. And um, as low as we can, or the as low as reasonably achievable, may not actually be enough for certain people with certain sensitivities um, to electromagnetic fields. So we just wanted to state that up front. Ideally, we hardwire everything, uh, but um, once we hardwire everything, that's the best you can do. But if you don't do that, if you do some other strategies that we recommend in here, that may not be enough for, uh, for every child. When we just talk about the physics of wireless radiation, it's always the devices that are closest to you that have the biggest impact. And in physics, there's a formula and it's uh, one over D squared, which is uh, one over distance uh, squared. So every time we double our distance, whether it be from a Wi-Fi router, a, a wireless printer, a smart board or a cell phone, we reduce our exposure by 400%. And the reverse happens as well. Every time we half our distance uh, from, from a source, our exposure increases 400%. And then if we contrast that with, if we hardwire devices and disable the, the, the wireless uh, transmitters in them, we actually get zero exposure. Um, and that's really what the ideal that, that we're shooting for is this zero exposure um, and hardwiring devices. That's the only one that actually deals with the root cause. So another important thing to, to take note of is the difference between an analog and a pulsed wireless radiation. So pulsed wireless radiation um, is the most common type and that's included in cell phones, Wi-Fi routers, uh, Bluetooth devices. Um, almost everything you think of as a wireless uh, technology sends information or ones and zeros via pulsing um, modulation. And it's that pulsing modulation that's more biologically harmful or annoying to the body. Um, and if we contrast that to like a, a microwave oven or like an FM radio station broadcast, when we look at biologically based guidelines, for example, from the European Environmental Medicine Doctors 2016 EMF guidelines, they recommend a thousand times lower exposure for Wi-Fi routers than FM station broadcasts. That just means they look at FM, FM radio as not as, as biologically harmful as the Wi-Fi. 
Now, what kind of sources do we see in schools as far as wireless radiation? This is not an all-encompassing list. This is just some of the more common ones that we see. And your schools may have different devices or different things that, uh, that are wireless in them. But common ones are obviously the wireless router, the smart boards, the laptops, the tablets, um, and, and cell phones. Other sources would be kind of like network clocks, sometimes printers, and, and wireless cameras. These are kind of the sneaky ones that, that people may not uh, be front of mind when they're, when they're doing an evaluation of a, of a classroom or a school. So when we look at wireless radiation, we kind of have three main strategies in how to reduce our exposure. The first one deals with that problem at a root cause level, and that is hardwire or disable wireless transmitters. When we actually do this and hardwire a laptop, for example, and turn off the Wi-Fi inside the laptop, that laptop is now not emitting any wireless radiation. So that is the best that, that, that we can do. Um, the second step, if we can't do that, we can either increase the distance, decrease the duration that we're exposed to it, or reconfigure uh, the device, perhaps lower the transmit power. So for example, if we doubled the distance from a Wi-Fi router, for example, we'll reduce our exposure by 400%. If we decrease the duration, maybe only have it on during a certain block of time um, or, or for certain periods of time and not having it constantly um, in the background uh, turned on while kids are at school, that can be of, of, of a great benefit uh, in decreasing the duration. And then reconfigure, we're going to go in in a few slides, um, how to reduce the transmit power of a Wi-Fi router and how much that will actually reduce the exposure. So these are all about reducing the exposure. Um, then the third thing that, 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 that's a strategy is shielding or blocking um, wireless radiation. This is only used for sources that are kind of outside the control of the school. Um, and it's not the main focus of, of, of this presentation. Okay, so hardwiring and disabling wireless transmitters. Um, so the, the benefit of this is just rock solid performance, right? If you hardwire a device, um, that is basically the fastest, cleanest, and most secure connection um, that, that you can get. As soon as you start putting in a, a wireless connection, that starts to become a bottleneck. And um, sometimes the reliability of Wi-Fi, it, it's basically subjective to the environment that it's in. If there's lots of devices connected, um, you know, the signal may not be as clear and you may not have, have as fast of a connection. Versus if you're hardwired, it just means that you have this dedicated high-speed connection uh, from your end device um, to the internet service provider of the school. So, and there's also this additional benefit of being future-proof um, where, you know, you install it once and it lasts a really long time versus having to, you know, if Wi-Fi 6 comes out, um, you might have to update your, your, your wireless routers or your wireless access points. So uh, the only caveat that we have for hardwiring is if you go get a hardwired connection to your laptops and tablets or the smart board, um, in your in the classrooms, just make sure you disable the Wi-Fi transmitter in the end devices like the laptops and and the smart boards. Um, when, basically, there's 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 a transmitter in your laptop that talks to the transmitter of the router, and the router has a transmitter that 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 sends the information back. So it's a two-way communication, and we have to disable it at both ends in order to get those benefits. Um, other things just to consider, like if, if this device doesn't move, there's, there's a good reason to, to hardwire it at that point. So, you know, smart boards, even the laptops that might be at the teacher's desk, you know, most of the time it would be nice to have a hardwired connection um, there for, for the teacher to use. So if it doesn't move, hardwire it. So when we increase distance, distance can be a key component here in, in, in reducing the exposure. So on this floor plan of, of a classroom, we have two dots. Uh, the red dot is in the center of the classroom. This one's closer to majority of the students um, and the majority of the students will have a much higher uh, exposure as a result. If we put the, the wireless router where the green dot is, kind of off to the side, that, uh, that exposure will, will have a much lower average exposure for the, for, for the kids in, in the classroom. Uh, and can be just an effective tool in, in, in reducing uh, the exposures just by physically moving uh, the device. Decreased duration. The problem with Wi-Fi is that it's always transmitting a, a signal and it transmits a signal 10 times a second at minimum and that's sending the network ID. Uh, so the network ID gets transmitted 10 times a second 
And any duration that we can reduce or physically turn off the Wi-Fi is of a net gain. So we can schedule this uh, sometimes in the actual hardware of the device. Uh, so the IT uh, folks in your school can help schedule that. And you'd have to work with the teacher to see if there's blocks of time where the Wi-Fi definitely is not needed. You know, it might be during lunchtime or, or certain blocks they, they, they use the tablets and certain blocks they, they definitely won't be using the tablets. Um, other methods are using an off-delay timer to turn off power at certain times. You can kind of think of this as kind of in some, in some bathrooms, you'll have a button that you'll, you'll select in your home and it'll turn on your bathroom fan for 20 minutes and then turn off again. And similar things can be set up that you, uh, you wire in the, the wireless access point to these, these uh, off-delay timers and you can set it for one hour, two hour, half an hour, and then it automatically turns off. Um, after, after that set period of time. Um, there are other systems where the teacher may have control through software. If you have a network management system or, or kind of a portal for the teachers, um, some software allows the teachers to, to kind of control internet access uh, through, through the software. And the other one is um, there's a, a GRS Eco 100 uh, Wi-Fi router. And this particular router allows you to register devices um, to the device and it basically sits in this listening mode until it sees a registered device and once it sees a registered device then it actually turns on the transmitter in the Wi-Fi router so it just sits there listening not actually transmitting any radiation until it recognizes and hears a, um, a, uh, a registered device so how this would work in the classroom is the teacher with their laptop would have the registered device to the Wi-Fi router and she could control whether or not the Wi-Fi router was, was, was transmitting Wi-Fi or not by putting her laptop in airplane mode or taking it off of airplane mode. Um, so it's kind of a simple solution um, and, it, and it's not all that complicated to get set up. Um, so we just wanted to mention that as a possible option as well. Reconfiguring. So this is changing mostly um, how the Wi-Fi or the wireless router or the wireless access point uh, in the classroom is configured. So there's three major settings that'll have a significant impact on the exposure in the classroom. And this is for classrooms that we can't go hardwired in. So if you can't go hardwired in, we can change the beacon signal from 10 times a second or 100 milliseconds to once a second. When we do that, you're transmitting a significantly less amount of pulses. So instead of 10 times a second, it's one every second. So it's a significant drop in, in the pulsing that, that's being sent through the, uh, to the wireless transmitter. The other thing we can do is change the transmit power from auto negotiate or auto or 100%, which is typically how they uh, are just the default settings in, in the Wi-Fi router. So they're meant to cast a wireless signal over the greatest area if it's set to 100%. And auto is a algorithm that tries to determine what the power is. And the problem with the auto algorithm is it might cater to the worst offender in the classroom. So you might be, you know, if there's a, a laptop behind a metal cabinet, it might be overcompensating for that and providing a larger signal than, than what's actually necessary. So what we found if you have the the architecture where you have a single wireless access point in each classroom. What we find is dialing back that power down to about 25% uh, should easily cover the classroom area and will reduce your exposure somewhere between 80 and 90% um, in the classroom just by doing that without affecting the connectivity to the end devices in the classroom. So, um, and then the other trick, the third trick that we have for reducing exposure is in most of the wireless access points, you have two radios or two transmitters in them. One's for the 2.4 gigahertz and the other one's for the five gigahertz. So if you just disable one of those and just use one of the two radios, not both, um, you can reduce your exposure even further. So the one that we usually recommend for people to start with is the five gigahertz. The five gigahertz is at a higher frequency. So it actually reduces the exposure faster through distance versus the 2.4 gigahertz, uh, the exposure doesn't fall off as quickly with distance. It's still, if you double the distance, it reduces the exposure uh, for 400%. It just falls off at a much quicker rate. 
Um, so your exposure will be less with a five gigahertz radio versus a 2.4 gigahertz radio. And uh, yeah, again, these configuration changes should not affect the connectivity to the devices, uh, but the, the, the exposure will significantly decrease. So I know the IT folks are like, you know, they really don't want to have um, headaches caused by connectivity issues if they go ahead and implement these, these changes. That's the headaches that they're trying to avoid, right? But what we actually find when schools do this, and, and it was kind of surprising when I talked to a few different people who went through this process, is um, when they had a separate wireless access point in each classroom, they, they, they set the settings back. Some of them dialed back the power as low as like 17% uh, transmit power on these devices and still had no connectivity issues. So when you do that, when you reduce it down to 25% or 17%, it's like a drastic reduction in exposure, probably 80 to 90% reduction versus having it at 100%. So, and the comments back from the IT people were the network operates more efficiently and there's no connectivity issues. Now this might be a little counterintuitive if you actually dial back the power and the transmit power that your network actually operates more efficiently. But if you think of these wireless access points, one in each classroom, and if you have a uh, if you have the transmit power set to maximum, chances are that there's huge overlaps in coverage from classroom to classroom to classroom, and that coverage uh, uh, basically bleeds into the next classroom, which has its own wireless access point. So there's a little bit more interference uh, between the Wi-Fi signals, and if you shrink down the coverage or the transmit power to only cover that one classroom then there's this no overlap and there's less interference. So it means just a more efficiently operating uh, network. Um, and, and yeah, and the conductivity, the actual uh, transmit uh, levels that the, the wireless signal levels that devices actually need to operate is, is actually quite low in, in, a, in a classroom setting. Um, so we've heard this from, from several different uh, IT folks about, uh, they were kind of surprised that this actually makes the network more efficient and there was no conductivity issues with this. Next, we want to take a measured approach when we're looking at identifying um, what your exposure is now, how low can you go with the exposure, and if you put any mitigation techniques in place to reduce the exposure, what is the actual effectiveness of this? So it all comes down to once we know what your exposure is and where it's coming from, we can come up with a plan to actually deal with it. And this also includes a little bit of information on how the technology is being used in the school. You know, we just don't want to blindly start changing the scheduling of, of the wireless routers. There has to be some input from the teachers who are using these devices um, just to make sure that, you know, it's still working for, for, for the teachers. The benefits of, of actually taking a measured approach is we know what the exposure is, we know where it's coming from, gives us a clear path, and just confirms the, the effectiveness of the strategy, right? This is your return on your investment. You know, we wanted to reduce exposure. How much did we reduce it by? So yeah, when we look at the different types of meters uh, that are used for measuring wireless radiation in schools, we've come up with three recommendations. Um, one is the Safe and Sound Pro 2 um, from Safe Living Technologies. The other one is the Acoustometer AM11 from EMF uh, Fields. And the other one is the HFW 59D Plus, and it's from the Gigahertz uh, Solutions. The first two meters there, the Safe and Sound Pro 2 and the Acoustometer AM11, they're really simple to use. You know, they have an on off switch. There's a volume control and a reset button. Um, they're very simple to use. Um, so if you're kind of doing it yourself or, or want to monitor your own situation, um, we recommend one of the first two meters. The HFW59D, it's a little more accurate, uh, but it's a lot more technical um, of, a, of a device. There's like something like probably 12 or 13 switches on there that do different things. And you have to have all these lined up to the right spot um, in order to get the correct measurements. All three of these will measure, you know, Wi-Fi, Bluetooth, all the common uh, signals that you'd find in a classroom. Only the Safe and Sound Pro 2 and the Acoustometer 11 will measure the full range of cell phone frequencies. So cell phone frequencies go from 600 megahertz all the way up to three to four gigahertz. And then um, there's also the 5G bands in the six gigahertz range and, uh, and millimeter wave. The first two meters will measure the, the, the 5G stuff up to the, the mid band. And there is a millimeter band of, of 5G that's in only select locations. Um, and there isn't a consumer um, meter that, 
that that uh, that we recommend at this time for that. But uh, if you're looking at doing this yourself, the Safe and Sound Pro 2 or the Acousta meter AM11 are the uh, are the recommended uh, meters. The other one is a little more sophisticated. Now, when you're actually doing the actual measurement, what do you ask for? Like, what do you need uh, as part of this um, evaluation? And what you're looking for is radio frequency measurements, peak or maximum. You're looking for measurements in microwatts per meter squared or volts per meter. And you're looking for a minimum frequency range of 2.4 gigahertz to 7 gigahertz. If you want to include the cell phone frequencies, then ideally we'd be between 600 megahertz and uh, 7 gigahertz to cover that as well. And the other thing you want is you want a resolution. So you want to be able to, to determine if it's at 10 microwatts per meter squared, all the way up to 1 million microwatts per meter squared uh, resolution to just handle everything that we might find in the classroom from biological standards. People who are kind of typically good at these type of evaluations are uh, EMF consultants and building biologists. So they're familiar with taking peak measurements and source detection um, at, this, at these levels. What you wanna really avoid is you don't want a radio frequency FCC compliant report. That will not meet any needs and won't give you any actionable items to, to, to address. Um, basically, those will only look at time average measurements um, and they really won't give us the peak measurements and may not be able to detect um, low levels of Bluetooth and, and, and Wi-Fi signals. So um, that is not what you want. It's gonna be very expensive to get a radio frequency FCC compliant report. Um, and um, that is, is, is not needed in this case and will not meet the needs of this, of this project. The other thing that uh, is needed if you're getting an outside consultant to do this, just ask for the make and model of, of the radio frequency meter that, that, they're, um, that they're using. If it's not one of the three that, that we've suggested there, um, just be a little suspicious. There is definitely higher grade equipment, uh, but there's also a ton of lower grade equipment that won't again give you any any value. The values that they'll they'll they'll, they'll be recording uh, will be highly inaccurate, and it'll just be a, a waste of money. And as for the experience level of the technician in measuring peak exposures, um, that's kind of key. There's a lot of industry people who are used to doing these radio frequency FCC compliance reports, doing time averages. Um, but they may not be uh, trained or, or just have the experience at, at looking at peak measurements and looking at finding you know, the sources in a classroom. One of the examples I have is in uh, December, I was reviewing a safety code six uh, compliance report, which is the same as the FCC compliance report in Canada here. And they use the meter in the bottom right. Um, and the frequency response of that meter, it basically just doesn't measure five gigahertz Wi-Fi and the accuracy of that meter it varies wildly with the frequency that you're measuring. Um, so they probably spent five to ten thousand dollars on this report, and it didn't give any information that we can even work off of. Even as a FCC compliance report or or a Safety Code Six compliance report, um, it, it was just useless even even for that. So uh, just be careful, um, ask for some help. Um, the, the Tech Safe Schools uh, folks are, are here to help you out with, with that portion if, you're, if, if you have any questions about that. Um, but it's, it's just something that uh, we just rather have you get the information you need to take action. So just be careful with that uh, when you're asking for, uh, for support or looking at contractors to do this for you. So here's just the basic uh, measurement protocol. We're gonna demonstrate this at the end of the presentation but it's uh, waving the, the meter in a figure eight pattern and slowly rotating 360 degrees. And then you wanna measure the average and the peak exposures and record that on, on a piece of paper. And uh, the things just to remember while you're doing this is uh, the person measuring it and everyone in the immediate area should just have their cell phones turned off and any wearable devices like smart watches, um, headless or wireless uh, headphones um, and those type of things. And then you just want to stay when you're measuring, you don't want to be within a foot of a, of a metal object and you want to stay six feet from any active um, cell phone. And that'll give you some accurate measurements that you can take action on and formulate a plan. So the interesting thing about the different uh, wireless technology exposures that you may get from school to school is you use different technology and different technology will actually give you different exposures. So on the screen now we have a school A and a school B. And school A has an active Wi-Fi in, in the classroom, 
And you can see that kind of the peaks and valleys in here are at quite low levels compared to school B, which has an active industrial enterprise Wi-Fi, and it has a little more heavy usage of the Wi-Fi as well. So, you know, we'll see a big gap where, where there was lunch, but on either side of the lunch hour there, it, from the center moving back on school B, is we see a higher use. And a higher use has higher peaks, and the exposure to, the, to a student or a teacher in classroom B is much higher. And you can see it's more of like an erratic signal, and this would be more biologically annoying or has more biological effects potentially in school B than school A, which has much lower pulses and, and not as much density of, of activity. Um, so this, this just highlights the differences that you may see from school to school or even classroom to classroom, um, depending on, on the infrastructure and the devices that are used in each classroom. So peak versus average exposure measurements. This is a, a pretty important uh, concept. The example here that's shown is a Wi-Fi beacon signal and it transmits a signal 10 times a second at a minimum. And that's just the network ID, whether you're using the Wi-Fi or not, that's just what it's doing 24 seven. So the, the peaks are ranging between 900 and it looks like uh, 300 or even 100 microwatts per meter squared. Those are the blue bars. And the maximum pulse that we've read in that, just in that one second interval was 940. But if we were to look at the average, if we did a time average over the whole time span, we'll get 50 microwatts per meter squared. And the reason why it's 50 is because these pulses are extremely short periods of time. So, uh, if you average that out over a one second interval, it just makes the number look extremely low versus our body doesn't react to the average. It re re reacts instantaneously to what's going on in, in, in the environment. So the pulses are, are extremely important and we want to know what the maximum pulse is, not what the average is. So when we look in the classroom, you want to determine where, where is it important to actually take these measurements. So you want to take them in the places where people spend most of their time and you want to consider areas a little more critically that are close to wireless devices. So the biggest one will probably be where the wireless access point is. If you have one in the classroom, it could be where the smart board is, um, where the teacher's laptop is. If there's a printer in the classroom, it might be associated with that. It could be a Bluetooth speaker in, in the classroom, perhaps. Um, so it just matters. Uh, where the people are spending most of their time or the students spending most of the time or the teachers and where you actually take the measurements. So the example I use is the red dot um, on this uh, floor plan shows where the wireless access point is, but in the classroom just below it, the blue dot just shows where the wireless access point is just below. And the students kind of close to that blue dot are going to have a much more significant higher exposure from from the blue wireless access point just below them, which is, you know, there's gonna be their feet, there's gonna be the floor, and then there's gonna be the wireless access point just right below them, versus the red wireless access point, which is, you know, eight to 10 feet above them mounted on the ceiling. Again, distance has a significant impact. So you may wanna more critically look at those areas directly above where that wireless access point is, just see what those maximum readings are, uh, versus uh, closer to the, uh, maybe the students that are hugging closer to the, the red wireless access point. Um, so d distance matters, but it also matters what's on the other side of the wall. For example, where the chalkboard is, is located on this, on, on this floor plan at the, at the top of the, the graphic. If there's a computer lab just on the other side of that wall, that, uh, you know, we may want to monitor um, where the students are uh, seating and, and the teacher's desk. Um, next to that computer lab if, if there's lots of Wi-Fi in the computer lab as well. So the recommended procedure for measuring wireless exposures in school. So this is kind of bringing it all together. Um, what we find typically works best is, is a kind of a four different steps. The first step is just kind of looking at the as found or what the typical measurements are. And if it's, uh, you know, one of the ways that we do this is, is take a measurement while the, while the students are actually in class. Um, or we can even stage this if, uh, if there's lots of tablets in the classroom, we can lay out the tablets, get them streaming a, a video, 
and then walk around with the meter and, and take the measurements. And that would be probably a worst case as found measurements. So we just wanna get a good idea of kind of what, what's the typical exposure. The second thing we wanna go is, is take some baseline measurements of like how low can we go? So if we actually turned off all the wireless um, devices and basically determine what's within our own control to reduce, that will be as, as low as we can go. So we turn off the wireless access points first, then we go around with a meter and search for the hidden wireless sources. This can be the printers, the Bluetooth speakers. It could be, um, you know, the network clocks, um, those type of things. And then we turn, we disable all those devices that we find, and then we take uh, a measurement with all the wireless devices off. And this is as low as we can go in the school. And what's left over is what might be coming out from the outside world, perhaps cell towers and, and things like that. But that's as low as we have uh, immediate control over. Then based on that information, we have what our exposure is, what our sources are in the classroom. And from there, we can look at, you know, what kind of strategies can we put in place? What's the solution? We can, you know, we can look at the individual lists of wireless devices and see, hey, can we put these in airplane mode? Does this actually have to be in Bluetooth? Can we only turn the Bluetooth on when we need the device? Can we hardwire certain laptops or tablets um, in certain areas? and come up with a kind of a reduction strategy uh, for, for the school or the classroom. And then we're gonna go out and implement those strategies, but it's always important to actually measure what that improvement was. Um, sometimes we make configuration changes um, and maybe it didn't, maybe those routers or those wireless access points didn't act like we thought they would. Um, and uh, so it's always nice to actually measure what the improvement is and just confirm that this strategy is put in place and is working um, with that. And it's probably worthwhile uh, to, to just do a check um, periodically after this has been done, uh, just do some spot checks to make sure that the, the plan is still working, make sure things haven't been undone with software or firmware updates um, and those type of things. So now we're just gonna go through the, the, the basic procedure for how to take uh, measurements. And we're gonna use the Safe and Sound Pro too. This is the one um, that I prefer. It's kind of the simplest one to operate. Um, but as you see here, it has an on off button. So we'll turn it all the way on. This button here uh, selects how loud you want the sound. Um, I'd probably set it to medium to, to, to start off with. And then this button here will reset the max value. So right now we're at 41. When I reset that, it, it resets it. Um, and you wanna reset it after every measurement that you take. So the figure eight pattern that we mentioned, um, we don't want the figure eight pattern to be like this, right? We want it to be like this. It's almost like you're scooping out the bottom of the, uh, of, of the peanut butter jar uh, on this side and reversing it on the other. And that's just what we do to get the, the most accurate reading. You want to extend your arm out as far as possible from your, from your body. And you don't want to come in within one foot of something metal. Um, and the other thing you want to do is stay six feet away from any active cell phone, uh, just for the most accurate measurements that we can actually uh, take these measurements and take action on. Uh, so when we say uh, do the figure eight and do a 360, And then what we, we would do is we would look at these numbers and we would record the maximum. And we'd also just record what the average value is. The average value is gonna be changing throughout, um, but we'd just like to know what that is because that tells us what the density of the signal is. Uh, so record that. And then you may uh, go to the classroom, uh, go to another area, you do the 360. Right, then you record the other, the other value, right? So this would be a peak of 73 and an average of about 0.8. And that's the basic procedure for measuring with the Safe and Sound Pro 2. Thank you, Mitch, that was, that was great. So we've got a couple of questions, Mitch. What do you do if there's a, um cell tower 
on the school property? How do you filter out what's coming off the cell tower as opposed to what you're getting in the classroom? Obviously, you can't turn that off, which would be great, but not likely. Yeah, yeah. So uh, when it comes from cell towers, there's several things that, that's going to affect your exposure from them. Um, one is distance, which is a common one that people focus on, but it's also how many antennas are on that cell tower and how many of them are actually pointing towards the classrooms or the school. Um, so those all, and what's between you and, and the cell tower, those are all pretty important things. But when we look at a Wi-Fi router, for example, in a classroom, we are orders of magnitude closer to that Wi-Fi router. And oftentimes that Wi-Fi router, you know, we can reduce our exposure drastically by just dealing with that Wi-Fi router. Uh, so, you know, part of the, part of the process of taking these measurements, turning everything off in the school is to um, see what is actually in your control. And you'll often find that that's much, sometimes a bigger factor than the actual cell tower. Not always, but, but often it is. So um, yeah, when it comes from cell towers, if you wanted to deal with the cell tower, you can try some shielding materials. Um, there's window film, there's paint, um, there's, a, there's a vapor barrier type of foil. Um, this paint can be applied on the interior or exterior. Um, so there's all sorts of options, but um, I always encourage people to explore what's in their control first, get that under wraps before you go on to the things that are a little less outside of your control. Mitch, can you talk a little bit about, um, you said it would be good to just turn off the 2.4 gigahertz radio and just use the five gigahertz radio, which we wanna be clear is not the same thing as 5G. A lot of people call us and say, oh my God, I have 5G in my house, I never knew it. That's not the same as 5G. Um, but I, I know that there may be some devices that may only work on 2.4, so you might wanna check that first before you shut the radio off. But talk a little bit about the, the reason for, uh, for just using the one radio. Yeah, so probably the simplest way to, to explain this is sometimes um, you can pick up AM radio stations from far away. So I'm in Calgary, Canada. I'm just north of Montana. And on, a, on certain nights, I can actually pick up an AM radio station from Seattle. Um, and, but I can never pick up an FM radio from Seattle. And the reason for that is the FM radio station is at much higher frequency. And they usually just don't travel as far, right? They're, they're, the, the, the radiation from them drops off more rapidly. And similar to the 2.4 gigahertz, which is much lower than the 5 gigahertz, the 5 gigahertz drops off much more rapidly from, from the actual router. So it doesn't go as far. So from an exposure standpoint, um, you know, if we had to choose one just based on exposure, we would probably choose the 5 gigahertz one just because the exposure drops off much quicker from the actual router. Um, if you're trying to cover a larger area, like a gymnasium or, 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 or a large area, uh, maybe a library or something like that, you may want to go to the 2.4 gigahertz because it's going to give you a larger coverage uh, at the same power, essentially. So yes, you know, some devices are backwards compatible. You know, they, they, they can go to 5 gigahertz or 2.4 gigahertz. Some other devices may only operate at the 2.4, so that might tether you to, to only using the 2.4. But if you're using one or the other, not both, if you can eliminate one, that would be a, a great advantage. Okay, and we have a, a unique question. Suppose your school building is a metal building. Right, um, so uh, what happens to radio frequencies, um, just like light off of a mirror, they reflect, right? So your exposure um, can actually increase if you were in a metal classroom, for example, um, and instead of the signal going out through, 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 the, through the normal building materials, if it's a metal classroom, it'll come back and reflect. And it, it does tend to have an increase in exposure when that happens, uh, but it's also a double-edged sword. It means like anything coming from the outside world, such as a cell tower, um, will reflect away from you. Um, so it is a pro and a con, um, and um, yeah, you just have to uh, be aware of that. Uh, but it's mostly just the exterior, or maybe the roof, um, that, that, would be, um, uh, that would become a reflective surface to these radio frequencies. Um, so it's not like it's creating like this echo chamber of, of signals bouncing around inside the classroom, but it will increase the exposure. Uh, another question, does the Wi-Fi go off automatically if you plug a computer or a, or a tablet into uh, Ethernet. 
Um, absolutely not. Uh, when you hardwire, whether it be a laptop, a tablet, um, any device, um, the secondary step that you have to take is to disable the Wi-Fi and the Bluetooth, ideally. Um, sometimes just putting a tablet or, or device into airplane mode will do it. If you're using Apple products, uh, Apple uh, iPads and uh, or iPhones, uh, if you hardwire those, um, you just have to be careful when you put into airplane mode. You want it, if you go to the gear settings and you see it disconnected and not saying off for the Wi-Fi and Bluetooth, it still means that it's going out and searching and transmitting a signal. So you just have to be extra careful um, about that. You want it, the, 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 when you go into the settings, it shows off for the Wi-Fi, off for the Bluetooth. If it shows anything else, it could be transmitting. And same for your phone, right? Your phone, you got to be very careful about that. The Apple iPhone, sometimes, you know, you got you to make really sure that those things are off because if they're not, they'll, they'll stay on. Yeah, and, and that's where these measurements kind of come in handy as, as well, to, you know, actually taking these measurements because you're going to catch a few of these, right? You're like, oh, I didn't know, you know, we got everything hardwired. We're great. We're good. Uh, but did you actually turn off Wi-Fi on all those devices? And, and uh, it's just a great way to, to check. We can't really tell otherwise, um, but uh, the meters will, will guide you to, uh, to, to, to anything that's, that's turned on that shouldn't be. A lot of people uh, tell me about, you know, that when they did the measurement in their home office, they suddenly found out that their printer, which they had connected with a hardwire, actually is broadcasting wireless signals all the time. So you got to go into those printers and shut them off. I assume the same would be true of smart boards and projectors. When somebody asked if the projectors hanging over the, the kids' heads are, are, are wireless. And of course, anything can be, I suppose. Yeah, yeah, and um, a lot of these devices, even uh, even smart TVs, could be uh, used in classrooms, um, right? Um, the you know a lot of these devices and printers, um, they they sometimes have two wi Wi-Fi transmitters in them. One is for Wi-Fi direct, so you can send information or print directly from your phone to a printer or to share information direct from your phone to a smart board or a smart screen. Um, so you kind of, the meters will tell you if it's transmitting or not. Um, so again, the meters become just invaluable to, to, to actually determining, um, you know, these little, these, these little details. You may have to go into the settings and fool around with this for, for a little while, um, and to, 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 to get it right. Um, but yeah, all, all those devices could be, depending on the vintage of the projector, um, it, it could have it, it could not. Um, if you're ever curious about any device, whether it has a wireless transmitter in it, um, you just have to look uh, for the, 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 if you look where the serial number is, it'll say FCC ID. If it says FCC ID, then a bunch of numbers and letters, there's a transmitter built into that device. It doesn't tell you whether it's on or off, but there's a transmitter, a wireless transmitter built into that device. Any device in the US needs that designation. So is it reasonable that you could ask your IT people to, uh, to you know, power down their, their Wi-Fi equipment that they put into the schools? I mean, wouldn't they be the, the right people to ask? Um, or, or do they, I, I, suppose, I suppose you need to do the testing first, right? To see what you've got. And, and then, but at that point, I would assume that any contractor who's, uh, who's working to, you know, who's got the contract essentially to put in the wireless stuff, you could just ask them, you know, take it down to the lowest possible level. Yeah, it, it, it's really, um, you really have to involve the teacher in, in this conversation because they're the end user and they're the one who tell you how they use the device. Um, the IT people can, can, can do the configuration changes and know what the capabilities are, um, right? They're kind of the problem solvers of, 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 of the school. Um, and, but the, you, really, it, you really have to understand how the teachers are using these devices. You know, are they using them every, on you know, every block or is it only once a week or is it you know, every day? Are they heavy users of the smart board? Um, you know, do, they, do they only use the iPads in this area of the classroom? Um, all these things kind of sift and sort and, and, and kind of drill down to kind of what the solutions might be. You know, can we hardwire just a, a particular table where, where the kids can work on, on the iPads or their, or their, or their tablets? Um, you know, and if it doesn't move, um, you know, try to hardwire it. Sure. When software is updated, uh, when your IT person or your contractor comes in and updates you know, it, it, is it likely that everything is set back to original, original factory settings and you, you'd have to go around and do that all, all over again? 
Um, it is something that you do have to uh, check. Um, it's, um, we run into this issue a little bit with printers um, specifically. Uh, when you basically you go through all the settings, you basically disable the Wi-Fi direct, you disable the Wi-Fi in it. Um, if there's a new laptop or something that comes in, especially if it's a PC and you have to install the drivers and you run through the yes, 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 through the installation, it can actually re-enable um, some of those Wi-Fi transmitters in there. Um, so um, similar type of thing can happen with Wi-Fi routers. It's not, I wouldn't say it's common, but it can happen. Um, so it's, again, it's, it, it comes down to the meters are kind of key uh, in monitoring the, this, this type of situation and just ensuring that, that things are kept um, uh, Wi-Fi free. But it is a potential for, um, for especially with firmware updates, um, and a uh, little less with software updates. In, uh, from my experience, that that can happen. So you do have to be diligent about uh, about testing. What about uh, BioShield type neutralizers that plug into a, a USB outlet? Are those a reliable source of shielding? Um, so I think any long-term solution. Um, uh, deals with the root cause of a problem. And what the neutralizers do is they are, basically I can't measure anything with my meters that are based in physics, what those are doing. A lot of those harmonizers and neutralizers, what they're trying to do is help your body at an energetic level deal with the, the stress. Yeah, I think a couple of things I wanted to mention while we wait for some other uh, questions to come in. One is that of course, you know, a lot of the, um, the medical issues that relate to wireless radiation have a long uh, period before they develop. So it's not as though we're seeing, you know, a lot of kids who are, you know, sick in the classrooms, but we don't, it's the long-term impact of those exposures that really has us concerned. The other thing, of course, is that there is a, a, a fairly large and growing number of students who do have what's called electromagnetic hypersensitivity, which is a real sensitivity to almost any level of wireless radiation. And so it's almost like a peanut butter allergy. You know, not every kid has it, but those who have it, for them, it's, it's really, really uh, difficult to deal in a wireless environment. So we're trying to help those kids too. And we'd love to see schools have, you know, Wi-Fi free zones, areas of the school that, that don't have Wi-Fi where those kids can essentially escape to and, and avoid the debilitating headaches or the other things that they, they can get from exposure. So that's really important. A couple of other things that have come in that, uh, that I wanted to address. One is uh, somebody said that she uh, talked to her school about this and the school went out and got a rec the recommendations of the FCC and the FDA. I, I think we've covered this you know, in other places. It's certainly covered on the internet. The FCC safety guidelines are 25 years old. They're based on science as it was understood back in the 1980s. They have absolutely nothing to do with biological harm. It's purely a thermal standard, which is how much heat does it generate uh, on, your, on your skin. Um, and that's how they measure the radiation. Uh, Mitch talked before about the difference between peak exposures and average exposures. And of course, the, the FCC is only looking at average exposures, which is not how humans experience life. We don't experience life at the average level. We have our peaks and, and our, our, our non-peaks. And, and so it's very, very important that we try to help the FCC understand the science and develop uh, guidelines that are relevant. As far as the FDA is concerned, uh, by charter, the F FDA is required to set exposure limits for devices. Uh, they've never actually done it. Um, what they did was one of the people in the FCC typed up, uh, I'm sorry, in the FDA typed up a letter, and that is their, quote, official position on wireless, which is that science just isn't there to support any notion of risk. Um, uh, Americans for Responsible Technology is part of a group of organizations that are uh, uh, hoping to file legal action against the FDA to finally do what they were supposed to do, to go through the official administrative steps that are required of any federal agency before it pronounces on a policy like that. Um, so we're hoping that, uh, that that will come about. And also, of course, as many of you know, the FCC is on the other end of a lawsuit from uh, Children's Health Defense and Environmental Health Trust uh, uh, challenging their 
their exposure limits. So, you know, as far as, as far as I'm concerned and as far as others are concerned in the medical community, uh, what the FCC says is virtually worthless. Um, and schools that are trying to hide behind that and say, look, we have this document that says we're okay. Um, I, wouldn't, I, I wouldn't rest my, uh, my reputation on that. And one of the points that the, the, is made in the legal uh, webinar the other day was, you can't hide behind the skirts of the, F, of the FCC anymore. Sooner or later, you're gonna have to take responsibility for the exposures that you are involuntarily uh, putting on kids in school. So, enough editorial from me. Uh, let's see what we got in terms of question. Um, Mitch, do you review reports that have been done for other schools? Um, you know, we have some, we've had a couple of people asking about this. Apparently, there are uh, people that are able to get their school to do a study, but their study consists of, you know, basically reaching out to, you know, to people who are, have already drunk the Kool-Aid. So, um, do you do you handle those reports? Do you review those reports? Is that within yeah. your yeah i i like i reviewed the I, I would love to be brought in or or get somebody who who, who knows what they're doing before the study actually be, become gets done um you know the the school that, that i reviewed the, the the study they spent you know ten twelve thousand dollars on this and it was you know even for a, an fcc compliant report it, it, it wasn't actionable so um you know, it's just nice to get off on the right foot, heading in the right direction, making sure they're using the right meters. Um, and then just reviewing the, the report, just, just make sure that it was, it was done properly. Um, and, uh, or, or beforehand, before the report's done, just to have a conversation with the person doing it and making sure they understand that, um, you know, there's some key things that'll make a big difference on, on whether or not you can take action on, on, on the actual report that's being done. And uh, I think we have some 5G people on the call today. Do any of your meters measure 5G and how would you go about doing such a thing? We're talking now about the small cell antennas that are appearing in neighborhoods across the country. Yeah, so, so 5G comes in, in, in three flavors, uh, low band, mid band, and high band. High band is the millimeter waves with the beam forming technology typically. Um, so the meters that we recommended in this uh, seminar measure the low band and mid band. Um, we don't have any really commercial grade uh, equipment yet to measure the the, the millimeter wave um, frequencies, and and those um, uh, those do exist in, in the U.S. and it it it's it's a minority of the 5G that's being deployed. Most of the 5G being deployed is the is the low band or the mid band, which these meters that we recommended will definitely handle. Um, to measure the the high band um, to biological standards that that, that we want to measure them to. Um, there, we really don't have an economical choice. There, there are some meters out there that are, you know, in the tens of thousands of dollars that, that we can rent and we can do those assessments if needed. Um, but uh, the meters that we have now handle most of the 5G and there's certain areas that have the, uh, the millimeter wave, um, but, but it's, it, it's not a majority of the, of the schools that we're talking about. 5G transmitters are also transmitting 4G. So you'd be getting, if you're measuring what's coming out, you're going to get the, the 4G signal primarily. Is that right? I mean, I think, I think the 5G thing is kind of an on-demand when you require it, when you need it, when your device says, I need 5G, that's when it turns on? Uh, specifically when I'm talking about the millimeter wave and the beam forming technology, um, it's, it's very energy intensive and, and it's kind of an on-demand. So if you're downloading a huge video or a huge file, it would uh, beam form to the actual phone or the device give you the high throughput for, for the duration that you need it for, and then turn off. But the backbone is basically a 4G, 5G network. Um, so this 5G is just another layer adding on top of everything else, uh, which is the concern. Um, and they're using some higher frequencies, um, uh, which are, um, are, are, are expected to be even more biologically harmful than, than the lower frequencies used in the past. I have a note from somebody who must know what they're talking about saying safe living technologies, which is the developer of the developer of the safe sound meter is developing a meter for the high band frequencies now. So, you know, yeah, yeah, there, there, there's actually several people that are, that are looking at this, at this problem. Um, and, uh, they're, they're trying to, um, you know, they're trying to get to market something that, that can be used on a consumer level or, or even a, a pro prosumer level. And, um, and there's some tricky physics issues that, that they have to deal with. And part of the issue is, is we don't know exactly what all the frequencies that they're going to use for the millimeter wave. 
Um, so it, it's, it's making the, the development a little tough when, when they kind of have a moving target. Yeah. Um, and they have to be quite targeted when they develop these, these, uh, th this equipment. Um, and if they broaden it out too far, then they lose the accuracy. If they narrow it into certain bands, then it's super accurate. Um, so th there's all these trade-offs when, when you develop these things. But yeah, there's several, several companies, Safe Living Technologies is one of them that, that's developing, um, that's looking at this problem. Yeah, and I know the FCC is still auctioning off more bandwidth to, to accommodate 5G. So I can understand trying to make a meter that captures that all could be very challenging. Um, what, which type of 5G frequencies? <laughs> this is a SpaceX question, and I don't blame you. Everybody wants to know what's going on with SpaceX. I'm not sure we're ready to address that. Are we, Mitch? Are we ready to address? Um, I, I can speak to it at a few different things at, at, at a high level. Um, and, um, you know, the, the interesting thing about, um, let's just say, satellites who, who are sending wireless transmissions down to Earth is the exposure um, when we look at the actual numbers is very small. And the reason for that is because the distance is so great, right? Every time we double our distance, we reduce our exposure uh, 400%. That doesn't mean that we won't see any biological harm from this, right? Again, this is gonna be another layer on top of everything else. And we know our body reacts in a non-linear fashion, right? Some kids with ADHD uh, get Adderall. Adderall is a stimulant, but yet it calms kids down. You know, that doesn't make any sense. Right, so our body reacts non-linearly to to um, wireless radiation as well. So there might be certain frequencies or even certain levels at low doses um, that can have huge impacts for for people's health. And there's just so many variables to to study in this in this area. It's just hard to determine. But just the fact that we have satellites overhead and more of them coming, um, even if the levels are low um, at the ground level, um, doesn't mean that it won't have an effect on on people. Um, it's just another layer and it's just adding to, to this, this, this soup of, of, um, of our environment. It just becomes another environmental factor and there's so many in our environment these days. Well, also I think, uh, as I understand it again, and I'm not a scientist and I'm not a medical professional, but as I understand it, in all of these wireless devices, it's the transmission of the signal that creates the problem. It's not necessarily the reception. And I would imagine if you're gonna have a, a, a device in your living room that's gonna be able to blast a signal, you know, hundreds of miles up into space, that thing's gotta be pretty darn powerful. Um, uh, have you ever, have you measured any uh, around any uh, Starlink, uh, you know, uplink, up Starlink uh, uplink devices to see what they're putting out? I would imagine it's pretty hefty signal. Yeah, yeah. In Canada, we we I can see them from my hot tub at our cabin. We can see the arc <laughs> of them over over the border, but um, they're not they're not where we we are at the at the moment. Um, but basically, it's it, you know I wouldn't be surprised if it's a dish on on the ground that needs to concentrate the signals, sim similar to to satellite TV, um, and um, and yeah, so it's it, it's it's it, it's an interesting uh, problem, and um, you know it's 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 not a wait and see type of thing, but we'll, we'll have more information as as this, as this rolls out even further, um, but it, you know it, we're already at you know. I think Alistair Phillips, his, his slide that he has shows, you know, we're one quintillion times more exposure than we were in the 1920s, yeah. right? And one quintillion is one with 18 zeros behind it, right? So, you know, as soon as we start adding more and more layers to this, it just becomes more complicated. And, you know, the, the biological effects of these, of these signals is, it's not just the exposure, because we know different effects happen at different exposure levels. We can even lower the exposure and have an increase in our effect. Um, but it's also the modulation. What, you know, what's the characteristic? How is this sent? Uh, uh, how's the information sent? You know, is it highly compact? It, you know, we talk about high crest factors a lot when, when we look at 5G because it's very sharp signals under, you know, just fractions of fractions of fractions of a second. Um, you know, it, it can be the, the modulation, it, it's the amplitude, it's the, there's so many factors when it comes into this that, that affect us. And, you know, coming down just to principles, if we remove the source, that's the best we can do. If we don't remove the source, we're making a compromise. Yeah, yeah. 
Well, Mitch, this has been really a, t a terrific presentation. Um, I've still got a few political questions that I need to answer, and we'll hold on to see if we get more technical questions for you. Somebody asked if we were in touch with the state education departments, and if the answer is yes, we are. Uh, the Tech Safe Schools Project, we launched our uh, kind of our initial effort uh, about three or four weeks ago. We were concentrating on schools in the Northeast and, uh, and some in California as well. Uh, and we've got uh, staff people who are following up with those schools. We will be posting on the website which schools have been contacted and what our results, what the results of that have been. So you can go on uh, in a few weeks, we should have that up and you can go on and check and see if your school was among those. Um, the other thing I want to say, one of the reasons that we were so intrigued with the, you know, when, when, when our primary funder came to us and said, could you do this? One of the things that really interested me is we don't have to deal with the FCC really. This is a decision a school can make. A, a, a school can make their own decisions. Schools are pretty much, uh, you know, independent and operate without interference from people. And that's for a reason. And that's a good reason, but the, it also works to our benefit because, um, you know, with the caveat that the FCC is still a problem, at least the schools have the opportunity to make the decisions they want. And that's, that's really important. Um, we have recorded this presentation. I may ask Mitch to, uh, to uh, join me on our own private Zoom call. We can work out the details with the camera and have him do some of those demonstrations for you again. But people have asked about uh, you know, whether this is gonna be available. And of course it will, we will make a, a good video uh, that'll be available so that anybody can log on and, um, and do that. Somebody's asked what to do about the National Department of Education. Uh, and I suppose you're talking about the E-rate program. Yeah, that's a real problem. I think it's a matter of um, education. So uh, Americans for Responsible Technology, we do quite a bit of work in Washington. We are a real pain in the neck for people. They, they, you know, they don't necessarily want to see us coming down the hall with our gigantic notebooks of scientific studies showing the, the harm that comes. So, um, but we do do that and we're going to keep, um, keep pressing on that. How come my question on cell phones is not being answered? Somebody has written to me. Lisa, I'm sorry if I missed it. Um, your question about cell phones, I try to look it up. If you post it again, I'll, I'll ask it right now. Um, I think I see it here, uh, Doug. She just sent it directly to me, I think. Oh, good. Um, sorry, I, I haven't been looking at the chat. Um, yeah, th there's just a question about uh, what about students, teachers, and cell phones? Oh. Any recommendations, examples of how schools can deal with those? There must be a big source of wireless or radiation in the classroom. So, um, yeah, it's it's uh, it, it, that that comes down to more of a, a policy thing with the schools. I think if you ask most teachers, they would prefer if the the devices weren't weren't brought into the classrooms at all. Um, and they are they are a significant uh, source of of radiation in in the schools, and it's one that uh, the students bring with them, right? It's a little less. A little less under your control, but there's lots of schools and lots of examples of schools that just don't allow it. Um, you know, Deborah Davis uh, mentioned. You know, in, in certain countries, they they just don't allow cell phones in in schools as as, as a general rule. Um, you know, and it's not just an EMF problem; it's a distraction problem. It's 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 so many other things that uh, the you know the the schools would probably benefit greatly uh, by having strict policies um, on this. Um, and, um, yeah, I'm not, I'm not, it's just, it, it's more of a policy thing than, than, than an EMF thing, to be honest. Yeah. And we, we cover that a little bit on the tech safe schools. It is our recommendation, although we're primary, primarily focused on reducing the, the, uh, the exposure from other wireless devices in schools. Uh, we have, we have a very strong recommendation that schools adopt and enforce a strong policy against cell phones in classrooms. It's, you know, for the poor teachers, it really has become a, a nightmare because, you know, the kids are busy texting to each other while they should be listening and learning. And clearly it's affecting how people, uh, how students are doing in school. There are num schools, there's a number of studies that show uh, that without phones and taking, you know, their notes by hand, the kids actually learn a lot more. They do a grade and they have better on testing. I mean, it's just clear as a bell, but we are addicted to our technology. I think everybody knows that. Um, you know, I have friends who can't, just can't let go of their phone. It's literally in their hand at all time, no matter what they're doing. They'll juggle anything else, but God forbid they should let go of their phone. So, but clearly that is a problem. Um, 
Well, thank you for everybody who joined the program today. Thank you so much for your recommendations. I'm sorry about the technical glitches, but we will get that fixed in a, a future edition of this. And I can see that we've got more questions for, uh, you know, for Mitch. So I'm gonna, uh, we're gonna call it a day here for now, but thank you for joining on. Keep the questions coming to me so that Mitch and I can prepare another uh, webinar in the near future and we can answer all your questions and, um, and, and uh, any other questions that you have. You know, we want to make sure that you're fully educated about this, that we're giving you the tools and the uh, stuff that you need to really advocate for change in your, in your public schools. And again, this is not just for, for your kids, but for every kid. Um, that's, our, that's our goal. So thank you, Mitch Marchand. You've been uh, great uh, at dealing with all the technical stuff, and I really, really appreciate the great information you've given us. And uh, again, I hope you'll come back and join us on a future webinar. I, I will make sure you do, actually. I don't even have to ask. Excellent. No, it's my pleasure, Doug. Thank you, everybody, for signing on. We'll put up this video as soon as we can, and uh, I hope you all have a good week, and thanks, thanks again for joining. Bye now. <laughs>